In the period leading up to the 1st of January 3000, it is likely that local people will look back, trying to visualize and understand the brain tree of 2000 and before. For as the present millennium approached, we too looked back to the brain tree of long ago, its origins now almost lost in the mists of time. Also of the last thousand years, including the granting of the market charter by King John in 1199, the building of St. Michael's Church, and onwards up to the present day. How did people live their lives? Who were they? And what did they do? And why? This film sets out to answer these questions by charting some of the major milestones in Braintree's history and providing a record of more recent events. Our story begins in the home of Andy and Beverly Barnes with their two children, Leslie, aged 12, and Jason, 10, as they celebrate the new millennium with family and friends. Jason goes up to his room. His sister soon sets off to join him. Archaeological evidence suggests settlement from about 1500 BC. So Braintree has been in existence three and a half thousand years. The track from Hertfordshire towards Colchester and the coast was already an important route. It seems that there was a small settlement somewhere in the Bank Street area and another one by the River Brain at the bottom of Rose Hill. The area was inhabited by a mainly farming tribe known as the Trinavantes. Braintree has a long and varied history which dates back to 1500 BC. 1500 BC, Iron Age settlements in the town centre and Mill Hill. AD 9, the Catabalorni from neighbouring Hertfordshire take over and in AD 10 establish their capital, Camelodunum, at Lexton. AD 43, the Romans invade Britain and capture Camelodunum. AD 61, the Trinovantes joined the Iceni Rebellion under Boudicca. Colonia Victricensis, Colchester, is burned to the ground. Circa AD 950, Athric, Saxon Lord of Manners, in Braintree and Brocking. AD 991, Athric, with local men, fight at the Battle of Malden. AD 1199, the grant of the market and fair charter to the Bishop of London for Braintree. The new town was built in the town centre, plus a new parish church, which was St Michael's. From the 13th century, Braintree develops as an important market town. Circa AD 1400, the woollen industry is established. 18th century saw improved turnpike roads and the introduction of stagecoaches. Braintree has at least four coaches a day to London and links also to Sudbury and Bury St Edmunds and Chelmsford. 1848, railway comes to Braintree. 1856, Daniel Walters builds new mill complex in South Street, enlarged in 1869. The development of other industries, brewing, malting, brush making and boot and shoe making. 1884, Francis Henry Crittle starts his metal window business in George Yard. In the 1890s, Lake and Elliot and Bradbury's start in business in New Street. Jay, do you reckon it's always been called Braintree? The first record of the name Branch Troy is in the Doomsday Book of 1086. The settlement by the river was known as Rains Magna. The tree part of the name may well come from the Celtic tray, meaning settlement. As Braintree is built on the top of the hill, the Celtic term for rising ground is bank or bunk, which put together would form bunk tree or bank tray, a settlement on a hill. Braintree's past, at times, has been marked by periods of depression, hardship and disruption. Police! Are they always head 
science. Since the 17th century, law enforcement has depended on a system of local government. The parish constable was often the local blacksmith, who in an emergency could be found at his smithy and was strong enough to deal with any violence. When the Industrial Revolution came, disgruntled farm workers rioted in protest at the introduction of new machinery. There was also disruption during times of economic depressions. In 1829, despite much protest, the Metropolitan Police Force was created, which could also be hired to assist in other areas. In the 1830s, Braintree introduced a system of part-time watchmen in addition to the parish constable. The lock-up near St Michael's Church was used for minor offences, while for more serious offences, prisoners were taken to Chelmsford Jail. Around this time, it was decided to appoint a chief constable, 15 superintendents and 100 constables in Essex. In Braintree, the county appointed a superintendent and three constables. They were accommodated in and operated from a building in Rain Road, commemorated today by Peel Crescent. They were dressed in a blue dress coat, white drill trousers, a hard hat, and were issued with a rattle, lantern, and batten painted with the county arms. As government in the new industrial age became more complicated, the most convenient agency for enforcement was the police service. This meant an increase in manpower. In 1869, a new police station was acquired in Fairfield Road, and with various adaptations, this stayed in use until 1993, when the present station in the avenue was opened. Two world wars brought extra responsibilities in protecting the public, maintaining security and obtaining intelligence. Greater mobility by criminals meant that quicker communication between officers became a necessity and access to the latest technologies essential. Inspector Moira Hours explains what should be done in case of an emergency. It's a Friday evening and you're sitting at home with your family watching the television when you hear a noise outside. One of your family members gets up, goes to the window and looks out into the street below. You see someone breaking into your car. What do you do? The automatic response is to phone the police. Dial 999. Our force information room is manned 24 hours a day and there are a number of operators ready and willing to take your call. As soon as you make that call, an operator will take some details from you, will ask who you are, your location, your telephone number, and what the nature of the call actually is. Having established as many details as the operator can, whilst we still may have you on the line, that operator will then ensure that the nearest available police unit attends that incident. On some occasions when that police unit arrives, the people who are responsible for causing damage to your vehicle may well have left the scene. But hopefully, any information in relation to the direction which those people may have taken, if they themselves have gone into a motor vehicle to get away, that will have all have been passed over the radio. So those officers that attend that scene will be in possession of as much information as possible. Jay, you know the CCTV cameras that are sent to Causeway House? Well, how do you reckon the police get to know about them? Because they don't work at Causeway House, do they? George Orwell would have had something to say about the extensive use of CCTV cameras if he were alive today. This technology, though, has its uses, as Inspector Hours explains. What normally happens if an operator, if someone who's actually monitoring those cameras, sees something, he'll immediately phone us here at the police station. It may be an emergency, in which case he'll phone our force information room via the 999 system. But if not, a routine call would come through to us 
here at this station and we will respond in exactly the same way. Jay, what did you reckon the council do? Originally, Braintree and Bocking had separate councils before they came together to form the Braintree and Bocking Urban Council. In 1974, Braintree District Council was formed, now covering within its boundaries 236 square miles, three major towns, Braintree, Whittam and Halstead, and 56 villages, comprising over 126,000 people. The council is served by 60 unpaid councillors and employs around 700 people. Each councillor is elected by an electorate of about 1,500 voters. The council offices are situated at Causeway House in Braintree with area offices at Halstead and Whittam. The main functions of the district council are planning, housing, environmental health, recreation and leisure. Additionally, the care call room deals with round-the-clock emergencies with the elderly or disabled. What follows was the last council meeting of 1999. Good evening, colleagues. Before we start, can I please remind everybody to use the microphone and will somebody please kick me because I'm the worst offender. In the year 2000, the council has an annual turnover of £64 million, part of which is collected through council tax and business rates. Will you accept those as a true record? Those in favour, please. Against, thank you. It has won several charter marks and awards for efficiency and service to the community. In 1993, it was voted the second best council in the world under the Carl Bertelsmann Prize and was chosen out of ten countries, including Germany and the United States of America. Braintree was awarded its market charter by King John in 1199. William Sancta Maria, who was Bishop of London and the Lord of the Manor of Rains, petitioned him on behalf of the local traders and business people of the time. It was also at this time that St Michael's Church began to be constructed. On the 16th of June 1999, Charter Day reenacted this important event, with many school children from the district taking part. They gathered at St Michael's Church and then made their way to Braintree Town Centre. A large crowd had gathered outside the Town Hall to witness what for Braintree was one of the most significant events in its development. The church is to be 
Representatives from the different schools came forward to meet the king and to receive coins, specially replicated for the day. Though. Christianity, in its development over the past 800 years, has seen many conflicts and changes. Braintree has played an important part in influencing and witnessing these periods in the church's history. One of those changes that had a profound effect on the development of the town happened in the University of Wittenberg in Germany in 1519 when a Catholic monk named Martin Luther nailed a document to its door which criticised the activities and doctrines of the Church. He set in train what came to be known as the Reformation, which fundamentally changed society. It must be remembered that at that time the religion of all of Britain was Catholic. St Michael's was built as a Catholic Church. It was Henry VIII who broke from Rome and effectively established the Church of England because of his wish for a divorce from Catherine of Aragon. And the whole of this period was a time of extreme religious intolerance. At a time of great change, people will take strongly opposing views. And so it was at this time, with people willing to die for their beliefs. Such was the fate of one William Piggott, a 19-year-old, who in 1555 was burnt to death in Braintree for holding to his faith and going against the state. A mural in the town hall centre depicts the events of that day. When you stand and look up at it, you're actually standing close by the place where the events depicted took place. The year after Piggott's death, five other men and women, all from Bocking, also suffered the same fate. However, in Braintree, as in Essex as a whole, those opposed to the established church, who came to be called the nonconformists, grew in number, but met in secret. In the early years of nonconformity, when it was illegal to hold such views, and those who did were persecuted for their belief, some of its followers decided that they should make a fresh start in the newly discovered Americas. In 1632, a large group of local people, who came to be called the Braintree Company, set sail with the Reverend Thomas Hooker in the ship the Lion. They landed in Massachusetts, where they founded a town that eventually came to be named Braintree. They were some of the first settlers of the USA. However, by the end of the century, there was a growing spirit of tolerance. And in 1689, the Toleration Act permitted dissenting congregations to meet, provided that they register their place of worship. By around 1700, there were four such groups registered in Braintree. In 1707, the first non-conformist meeting house was built in Bocking End. This was replaced in 1818 by the existing Congregational Chapel. Braintree Congregational Church was formed in 1787 as a result of a split from the Bocking End Church. It first met in a barn in Coggleshall Road, but soon a meeting house was built in Sandpit Lane on the site where George Yard and the Quadrant Store now stand. 
In 1832, a new church was built in London Road, which stands to this day. At their peak, three quarters of those attending church in Braintree were nonconformists, with Methodists, Quakers, Baptists and other chapels and denominations adding to the congregations. Bocking End and London Road each had over a thousand people attending services every Sunday. The level of nonconformity in the area gave rise to opposition to the age-old system of payments of a local rate levied by the established church. What had started as a local issue in Braintree had by 1832 become a national issue. Eventually the Braintree Church Rates case was resolved in the House of Lords with a ruling which effectively established the principles of religious freedom in the country. With all denominations, Church of England, Catholics, non-conformists and non-Christians free to follow their own beliefs. Braintree's Catholic Church was built in 1939, the first service being held on the 31st of August, the last church to be opened in Europe before the start of the Second World War. The service filmed on the 31st of August 1999 was in celebration of its Diamond Jubilee. declare your allegiance to Christ and your rejection of all that is evil, and therefore I ask these questions. Do you turn to Christ? I turn to Christ. Do you repent of your sins? I repent of my sins. Do you renounce evil? I renounce evil. And you must now declare before God and his church that you accept the Christian faith into which you were baptised and in which you will live and grow. pray for God to give his gifts, or the Holy Spirit to give his gifts to those about to be confirmed. <coughs> Confirm, O Lord, your servant Leslie, with your Holy Spirit. Amen. Jason, with your Holy Spirit. Amen. What did they sell in the market? And were there shops as well? Well, there would have been shops, but they wouldn't have been factories like Dad's. Although Braintree developed as a market town, more recently it has diversified in its economic outlook. The main trade during the Roman period was the provision of services for the military. Moving on to the market time of 1199, we see here the development of the town quite distinctly. There was a provision of services for pilgrims who were making their way on their pilgrimages to Canterbury and Bury St Edmunds and other places like that. 
They needed places to stay and food. There were shops being developed for the provision of the needs of the people of Braintree. Animals were bought and sold in the market. It was also a place where farmers, for instance, would hire their workers for the season. With the development of the woolen industry in the 15th century, this brought to Braintree still more prosperity. With that prosperity, merchants employed servants. The weekly market continued to bring people in from the surrounding area and the annual fair brought in people from other parts of the country as well. But it wasn't all good times. The woolen industry had its ups and its downs. And there were times when Braintree's economy was in decline. And people were very poor. Because if they weren't in doing their work, and they weren't being paid. The medieval combat tournament, held at the Tabor Triangle site, saw crowds of people flocking to see the swordsmanship of the knights of old. A medieval wedding was also included in the celebrations of Charter Day. The 18th century, however, saw Braintree develop as a coaching town, with regular co daily coaches to London coming from places like Sudbury, Bury St Edmunds. This meant an increase in prosperity in the inns in the town and more employment. The next major development was the introduction of the silk industry. In 1810, George Courtauld built a silk mill in Chapel Hill. His son Samuel also had a silk mill built in Panfield Lane in 1816. And then later on, in 1818, in South Street. Walters built the new mills in South Street in 1856, and this, these again were enlarged in 1869. Along with other firms who came into the town in the silk industry, this provided a large lot of employment for the people of the town. With the increase in these trades, the town grew not only in population, but in prosperity. Lots of people moved in from the outlying villages to come to work in the new industries that were being established. With the advent of the First World War, Braintree changed once again. The local industries changed into war munition work and people came in from other parts of the country to help in this. Also too, the military were billeted in the area and this required the shops and other industries to provide for their needs as well. After the First World War, Braintree in common with many, many other places in the United Kingdom suffered from economic depression and many people were out of work. Crittles, one of the firms who were able to help in this respect because their business was booming and many people actually came from other parts of the country into the town to work at Crittles. 1939 plunged once more into a world war the Braintree Industries again put their efforts into the war. Braintree as a town is affected, there is bombing, there is damage, but in the main Braintree survives the war quite well. 
Each year, on the Sunday nearest to November the 11th, many people meet at the Braintree and Bocking Public Gardens to remember those who fell in past wars. Jason, being in the Scouts, attends the event with his family. and our determination into deep. As men died for peace, we may live for peace, for the sake of the Prince of Peace, even Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Council. And after the war, things have changed. The industries that once prospered were finding difficulty in the international markets, many of which, of course, have disappeared. And as a result, many of the larger industries went into decline. And from the 1980s, Many of these large firms, in fact, not only declined, but also closed down. Since then, we've seen the development of industrial estates around the town, where many smaller firms have flourished and developed, thus forming the basis for a new form of economy for the town. We've also seen the eastern part of Braintree being redeveloped under the Government Regeneration Scheme. And this is proving to be a benefit and will, as we look forward to the future will be the place where the future trade of Braintree will develop. Braintree's whole economy was really built on textiles going back to about the 13th century. Um, it was monks in Bocking who are credited with starting the wool industry, although it probably was established even before that. But by the 17th century it was the main economic activity in the twin towns of Braintree and Bocking. And it was because of the wool industry that people like Courtaulds came to inherit the weaving skills that had built up over those hundreds of years. And also the established merchants and trade and it was really the combination of the skills of the Courtaulds as really imaginative um, manufacturers in the 19th century that took the area to the really um, greatest importance um, for producing silk commercially. And of course from that developed man-made textiles, so that's when we took on a worldwide significance. Having the textile industry in the town and also the market is why the railway came and the railway was pivotal for other industries establishing. And at the end of the 19th century it was the engineering skills that had developed through textiles that diversified into things like making bicycles which led to the rise of people like Lake and Elliot. And so by the 20th century you've got 
three routes, heavy engineering through lakes and then Bradbury's later on. The textiles continued right through to the 1980s and um, Crittles developed more and more in window technology and they are still one of our leading companies. And the interesting thing is now, as we go into the next millennium, we are going into a service economy and the new Freeport Village is a conglomerate of retail outlets, but they are textile based. So you could say we've gone a, a complete full circle over a thousand years. Back at the museum, Jason views some workplaces from the past. This seems different to where my mum and dad work. The Springwood Industrial Estate off Rain Road has grown steadily with smaller manufacturing businesses replacing Braintree's large-scale industries. One of the units on the estate is the workplace of Andy and Beverly. The company is involved in metal stock holding, dealing mainly in stainless steel, aluminium and bronzes. It employs a workforce of nine people. No All right. Thanks very much. Um, bye. Andy and Beverly work within the same office. Beverly works part time, which fits in well with bringing up the children. Employment practice has changed dramatically over the past century, with women playing an increasingly important role and men beginning to share more in the upbringing of children. Jocelyn Chase, an estate agency in Bank Street, is one of Braintree's long-running businesses. Benjamin Jocelyn describes its development. My great-great-great-grandfather, Benjamin, same as my name, who started our family businesses in Braintree back in 1777. The business didn't actually start then, but he was in uh, articles to a cabinet maker by the name of Barrett, who we think was in the High Street Braintree. The next elder son was, in fact, my grandfather, Lewis Henry Jocelyn, whom people will remember, I hope. And during his time, major alterations were made to the business premises, which were on the corner of High Street and the west side of New Street. There were two shops in High Street, and they stretched at one time probably nearly halfway down New Street. It might be of interest to know that in that block of buildings were at least four public houses, three of which were of particular disrepute and became known as Great Hell, Little Hell and Damnation. In 1961, my brother Brian and I joined my father and at that time we opened new premises for the estates business in Bank Street, Braintree on the, the site where in 1941, February the 14th, uh, a whole stick of bombs had destroyed part of the centre of the town. The uh, auction and estate side of the business fortunately continued to flourish as the town grew, and in 1989, when Essex County Council had their competition to try and find the oldest business in Essex, we were in fact judged the fourth oldest existing. Interestingly, the Chelmsford Chronicle came second. Time has gone on so far as uh, my brother Brian and myself are concerned, and we are both at retiring age. We remain consultants to the new firm, which goes under the title of Jocelyn Chase, being a, a partnership between Chris Woodhouse and John Chase. And we hope that the 21st century will bring them as much success as we have enjoyed in the past. Townrose is another of Braintree's long established businesses. Jim Townrow describes its history. In 1871, my grandfather came to Braintree with his young wife. He took over a clothing shop from Mr. Cuthbert 
and he paid the rent for 65 High Street from the landlord of 55 pounds a year. The landlord's name was Mr. May. They lived over the shop, and with the property went a large garden, the other side of Sampit Lane, where the, the multi-storey car park now stands. My grandfather employed a gardener, and he required two shillings a day, or 10p a day. The Braintree cattle market was actually held in the high street. In 1894, my grandfather bought his own shop, number 42 Bank Street, next door to Mr. Bartram's gun shop. About 25 years on, Mr. Bartram became chairman of Braintree Town Council. In 1902, my grandfather died of pneumonia at the age of 58. And his son, Charles J., had to come home in order to take over the running of the Braintree shop. In 1919, we moved to a much larger shop in the High Street, numbered 51 to 53, previously occupied for many years by Henry Pryke and Son, high-class tailors and retailers. Five years later, we were the first shop in Braintree to build large arcade windows. These were crammed full of stock from floor to ceiling, and many customers chose their purchases from these windows. My brother Peter and I, James, the third generation of Town Road to run the business, spent all our working lives in the company. I joined in 1935 at the age of 17, and 64 years on, I'm still working, if only mornings. Many customers expected their purchases to be delivered to their homes. And even a, a shirt or three pairs of socks. And so errand boys were in big demand. Eventually, we replaced our errand boy with a porter, Freddie Buttle. In 1982, my son, Richard James, took over from me as managing director. This heralded a time of rapid expansion and growth in the adoption of modern technology. We built our store at Frinton-on-Sea, we purchased other property in Braintree High Street, and we built our existing store, 6567 High Street, and backing onto George Yard Shopping Centre.